and welcome. That makes me feel real good. But while you're on your feet, let's speak now to he who's made all this possible. Our God, we come to thee in simpleness of heart. We come with our heads bowed because that we know that thou did breathe upon us and we come from the dust and we are your subjects of the kingdom. And we pray, Father, that this night that thou will find a place in each of our hearts to make thyself known to us and to the people who we associate with. We would want to thank you this time for this fine church and for its pastor and for all who are associated with it. And we want to thank you for these who have drove through the snowstorms over the slick icy grounds to get here to worship Thee with us. O oh, blessed God, someday in a land beyond the river where we'll never have another snowstorm or there'll never be another sick person to be prayed for, another funeral service to be held or even another gospel message to be preached. We want to meet there, Lord as unbroken families. Forgive us of our shortcomings. Let us know that our days are few here on earth and what we have, may we spend them to thy honor and thy glory. Give us many more happy meetings like this. Bless each one of us as individuals. Bless us in our needs, Lord, for they are many. And when life is finished, may we meet at thy house. Until then, may the barrel never be empty in our houses. May the cruise never run dry until we see our blessed Lord coming in the skies to take us away. Keep us healthy and happy. In Jesus' name, amen. There is so many things that I could say to a hardly know just how to start. And by the way, these handkerchiefs each night that's laying here, I'm so glad that you believe and praying over the handkerchiefs. Now, thank you, kind sir. Many people anoint those handkerchiefs, which is all right. Anything that our blessed Savior will bless, I'm certainly for it. But if you'll bear record the word, Acts 19, Paul just took from his body handkerchiefs and aprons. I believe that Paul was a fundamental preacher. Don't you believe so? You want me to tell you where I think he got that? I think he got that from... In the scriptures where the Shunammite woman, she had lost her baby, which the prophet had blessed her, and she gave birth to this fine baby. And when the baby died, <clears throat> the Shunammite woman had one of the servants to saddle a little mule, and she rode to the prophet, for she knew that God was in that prophet. And that was God's representative, that was his agent on the earth. And she thought if she could get to the prophet, I do not believe that she thought she would get her baby back, but she would find out why God took it. And God don't always reveal to his prophets everything that he has in his divine plan. So when the woman arrived, the prophet did not know what was the matter. So he said to his servant Gehazi, here comes that Shunammite, and she's troubled, but God has hid it from me. And while we're on the subject, if you would just think of this. He sent Gehazi forward, and he said, go see if everything's all right. 
And he said, is all well with thee? Is all well with thy husband? Is all well with the baby? What's the Shunammite's answer? All is well. And her baby lay in a corpse. But she had arrived at her destination to where she believed that God would make known unto her what had happened. All is well. Wonder if we tonight could think that. After the scriptures being read of the Lord Jesus and his blessed will to heal us all. Or save us, forgive us of our sins. Is all well tonight? And notice, the prophet said to his servant, Take my staff and go lay it on the baby. Now, Elisha knew that the Holy Spirit was in him. And everything that he touched was blessed. But now to get the woman to believe that. So he said, Take my staff and go lay it on the baby. I think that's where Paul got taken handkerchiefs from his own body, go laying on the sick and the afflicted. However, the woman didn't think very much about the staff. She said, I'll not leave you. And he, she stayed right with him until she got what her heart's desire was. That's the way we do with Christ. Stay right with him until we get what we ask for. Now, these handkerchiefs, we pray over them. And if your handkerchief is not up here and you desire one, just write to me. Now, I'm not wanting to get your address, dear friends, because I have an awful time getting letters answered. I don't have any programs to sponsor anything. It's just getting somebody to help me get the letters answered. But I will pray over, maybe not a handkerchief. We send out thousands of them. It's all around the world. It's very expensive. So I can't afford to send a handkerchief, but I get cloth and cut it in little parcels and pray over it and send it. Now, the farm letter, we got a prayer chain around the world. But now the letter you get will be made up mimograph by a secretary. But the handkerchief or the little parcel I've prayed over. See, if I had faith in you as a servant of God and my baby was sick, I wouldn't want a secretary to pray over the handkerchief. I'd want you to pray over it. And do unto others as you'd have others do to you. See? Pray over it. It's yours free. No, nothing, no charge to it. Just send down. And we'd be glad to see it. send it. Just post office box 325, Jeffersonville. If you can't think of that, just write my name. And Jeffersonville, Indiana is a very small city, about 27,000. And, and so just round it to Jeffersonville and anybody there knows me. I want to say that this has been a glorious day for me. As I was sitting in the room this afternoon praying, I was thinking about some meetings you get to. We love, we can't expect everything to just be wonderful. I wish I could take this group with me everywhere. Give me a prayer group like this and give me a two weeks meeting somewhere. Let all the unbelievers pile around behind them that wants to. God will bless just the same. <laughs> when you got them standing like a brick wall, that's wonderful. I believe then that God can do anything then when you feel the freedom of the Spirit. And I certainly do thank God for this wonderful church and for its pastor and for all the workers and this little singer. I can't think of his name. Golden. Brother Golden, he sang that special for me a while ago. And I heard it, Brother Golden. I was standing inside the door with some of my little lady friends, about eight or ten years old, little boys standing around there for autographs. I can't even read my own writing. Now, how are they going to do it? That's what I'm wondering. <laughs> and then Mrs. Branham was standing there, and there was, I think they slipped over with her to... And even my little boy, Joseph, wanted to do some writing, too. <laughs> he could probably be as plain as his dad, so he's two years old. So we want to express ourselves to you the best that we can that we appreciate being here. And I, I say this for myself, my family, Brother Lee Vale here, 
Brother Woods and his wife, Brother Leo Mercer, Brother Gene Gold, and all that's in our party, we certainly thank you. A few moments ago, coming in, somebody said they took up a love offering for me. I didn't come for a love offering, friends. I come just to be your brother. But I so, sure appreciate that love offering. I'm a poor man. I could have been a millionaire. If I took, I never took an offering in my life. Never. I'm 27 years in the ministry. Never took an offering in my life. I keep looking at my wife. <laughs> Every time I get to that part, she thinking about an offering. <laughs> she always gives me that once over. <laughs> I'm going to tell it, honey, anyhow. I was one time really up against it. You know when you get to that place where you just can't make ends meet. Now, I was working as game warden here in Indiana. And so the, I said to my wife, I'm going over tonight and take up an offering. I just can't owe this any longer. I'm, she said, I'm going over to watch you do it. <laughs> <laughs> we lived just across from the tabernacle. Now, those people would do it my head sell their property, give it to me, but I was able to work. Wish I could do it now. I wouldn't have to even take a penny. But I, I went over and I said, we didn't even have an offering plate. And I said, folks, I've met a little, or oh, just a little place. I said, I need a little money. I wonder if you people would feel bad at me if I tuck up a little offering, each one of you, if you're dropping a little something. I said, Brother Wiseheart, will you get my hat? And he reached to get my hat, started off. I looked sitting down here in front, a little old lady. How many remembers them women used to wear them little aprons and turn their pocket on the inside, carry their pocketbook? And I, a real prayer while you reached in and got one of those little pocketbooks that snaps on the top, begin to reach down there for those little nickels. Honest, I, I couldn't do it. Oh, I said, I was just teasing. I didn't mean that. <laughs> so, I didn't go through with the ordeal. You know, there used to be an old man right down from up in here somewhere. Had long hair and beard. His name was John Ryan. I don't know whether you ever knew him or not. How many ever knew John Ryan from this country? All right. God rest his gallant soul. He rode a bicycle down there to my house one day and gave it to me. They'd been sitting out there a long time, and I went out to the 10-cent store and got some red paint, painted that old bicycle up and sold it for $5 and paid the debt anyhow. I didn't have to take up the offering. So I come almost that time of doing it. So I will assure you, friends, my expenses runs me about $100 a day. My office and my upkeep, just about 100 a day. Now that's, no, it sounds like a whole lot, but it isn't. What do you think Brother Roberts runs a day? I think the last report I had was 7000 a day. Billy Grimm's runs sometimes $1,000 a minute in his broadcast. That's not his television, broadcast worldwide. So you see, that's very small comparing with that. So it, I thank you for your offering. And by the grace of God, every penny that I'll spend it to the kingdom of God the best that I know how. Someday in heaven, may that you receive your reward, if not your own earth. Now, we're going to read some of his blessed word. Anytime that I can be a favor to you, I will do it. I used to say this, the nights never get too dark or the rain never falls too hard, but what I would come to you. Well, now, in contact, direct and indirect, with about 10 million people. That's a big thing to say. I might not be able to come to you, but if you'll just get me word of your need, I'll certainly pray for you. I'll lay it home and my wife knows, and those who ever come to visit me there. But all night long, that telephone, just not but a few minutes sleep, let's get away from home. Accidents on the road, around the nation, everywhere, people calling, 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 just constantly all the time. We've had as many as 64 long-distance calls an hour, that's four phones answering now, averaging 64 calls an hour, day and night. Think of that. You can imagine how it is. So, but we're always glad to get them. Always glad to do something to help someone. You know what a blessing is? Do something for somebody else. That's right. And if you have a neighbor 
or somebody that's done you injustice, remember this from me. Don't never turn him down. Take, take him to God in prayer and see what a different attitude you'll have. If you're sincere in your prayer, you stand shoulder to shoulder with him. Though he's done you wrong, injustice, but you just take that man to God and stand there in the presence of Father. One time and say, Father, my neighbor here has done me wrong. But I guess what? When you go to tell him his wrong, it'll not only help him, but it'll help you also. And you'll see what he's been through and the temptations and things. It'll change your attitude towards that brother. And it'll help him also. You always are doing good when you're praying one for the other. Now, if you've got your Bibles open for my final text in this meeting, hoping to come again to you as soon as I can. Revelations, the third chapter and the 20th verse. I wish to read for a portion of Scripture. And to re- get a context from this text. The reason I want to read it, I'm standing here, I don't know what the Lord Jesus is going to do. And many of you gathered out in the overflow rooms full and standing around. But yet, if I read the scripture, God will bless that much, I know. I think the scriptures ought to be read at all times. Here's the reading. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. And my subject tonight, if I should call it that, is the, the door inside the door. This is an unusual text. But it's a portion of God's eternal word. God's word is so real. And that's enough scripture right there to take all communism out of the world and convert the entire world. It is an invitation to salvation. It's also an invitation to healing. The guarantee of eternal life oh it means so much if it be received in the light that it's wrote in you know here some time ago there was a federal trial I believe it was in the days of the late Abraham Lincoln the president of the United States and there was a soldier that had committed a crime And he was going to be executed. He was sentenced to death. Finally, someone persuaded the president to spare his life. And the president, in a hurry, said, All right, I'll spare it. So he just signed a piece of paper, released so-and-so, Abraham Lincoln. Sent it. And when the carrier of this brought it to the jail... And showed it to the prisoner and said, present this. Why? He said, that's no good. It's just a piece of paper. Said, but it's, it means between your death and life. Because it's got the president's name on it that you're pardoned. Oh, he said it would be on an official paper. It would be sealed with his seal. And so forth, all the ritual that it would have to be before he would receive it. And he couldn't persuade the man to receive it. And the next morning he was shot at sunrise. Well, after Abraham Lincoln's name being signed that he had pardoned the man, and now here he lays a corpse, then what? So it was tried in federal courts. And here was the federal court's decision. A pardon is not a pardon unless it be received as a pardon. That's the way God's promise is. 
It is not a promise unto any persons that will not receive it as a promise. But every word of God is a promise to those who believe that it is a promise. It's your mental attitude towards it. Whether it's a pardon or whether it's a promise for your healing. For his words are eternal. I wish I could think of the poet's or the artist's name. That's all my mind now. Several years ago, who took upon himself to portray this passage of Scripture into a picture. And it took him just about a lifetime to paint this picture of Christ knocking at the heart of the door at the heart. And all famous pictures, before they can ever go into a hall of fame, they first have to pass through the critics. And I like that. Because it is about like the church. Before the church can ever go into the great rapture, first it has to come through the critics. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecutions. There is no excuses. There is none that's deferred. All have to pass through that line of persecution and criticism. But then if we can pass through that with such a life that the critics cannot point their finger to anything that's true, then the picture is ready then for the great hall of fame. And this artist who painted the picture, when the critics was looking it over, they said, Sir, your picture is wonderful, but there's just one thing about the picture that's wrong. He said, You have Christ portrays all right and the door is all right but you don't have any lock on the door so why would he be knocking on the door if there's no lock on the door and the artist said I painted it thus because in this door the lock is on the inside the one that's on the inside has to unlock the door so he can come in. And that's true. Christ cannot. But you are the only one that can open the door. You can say, come in Christ. I welcome you. Still, he can't get in till you unlock the door. Then you can come in. What does anyone knock on another person's door for anyhow? It's to gain an entrance. You've got some business. When someone... They have something they want to talk over with you. And those great knocks has come on great doors all down through the ages. What do you think would have took place... In the days of Augustus Caesar, if he would have had the opportunity or something to go to a peasant's door and knock on the door when he was the emperor of Rome, would that not have been a great honor for any Roman subject for Caesar Augustus to knock at their door? Or what would it been when the great Napoleon, though feared by people, standing at Waterloo not long ago in Belgium, I was reading his history when I looked up on the relics of the great battle, and he was so mean 
And when the mothers went to put their little babies at bed at night, like mothers sometimes say, the boogeyman will get you if you don't be good. It was more fearful to say, Napoleon will get you. He was so feared. He put people to death. But how one of his subjects would have felt honored to have him knock at their door. Or the great Adolf Hitler that's just passed away. What an what a honor it would have been for any of his soldiers. Maybe a poor man lived down along the river. And for Hitler, the fear of Germany knock on his door and want to come in to talk to him a little while. What an honor it would have been for that soldier to have Hitler knock at his door while he was the fear of Germany. Oh, it would have been a great honor. Or I would say this. It would be a great honor to the best Democrat in South Bend for our President Dwight Eisenhower to knock on his door to visit him. Though you differ with him in politics, he's one of the greatest men in the earth. Our beloved President Dwight Eisenhower. Certainly it would be an honor. What makes the honor is the importance of the one that's knocking. Or just recently, the Queen of England visit this United States. What an honor it would have been to any of you people here tonight, here in South Bend or in the United States, if this Queen, though you're not her subject, but if she would have come to your door and knocked on your door, how happy you would have been to go at the door and she'd say, I am the Queen of England, the greatest Queen on earth, the Queen of England. Though she has no jurisdiction over you, yet she is a great woman. You would have said, Your Honor, Queen, come into my home. If there's anything in this home that you want, you can have it. If there's any trophy or anything that I can do to make you welcome, come on in. You are welcome. And when you welcome anybody like that, if you don't give them full premises while they're in your house, they're not exactly welcome. That's right. If you welcome anybody, if I come to visit you and you say, Welcome in, Brother Branham. Make yourself at home. Well, I'd come in, take off my shoes and sit down. Put my feet up in a chair somewhere. I got hungry, I'd go out to the icebox and get something to eat. Hallelujah. Sure, I'm welcome. Oh, we'd welcome somebody like that. Because of their importance, the queen. If you had something that you cherished, you'd gladly give it to her. If she wanted it, because she's a great woman. But I want to ask you something. Who's more important than Jesus? And who's more turned away than Jesus? He's the most important person that can knock at your door. And he would never knock unless he's got something good for you. And he's He's turned away more than any person that there is on the earth. Jesus is turned from the door, a heart's door of men and women, when he knocks daily trying to get in. Lo, I stand and knock. If any man hear my voice and will open the door, I will come in. And we'll sit down and sup with him. And he with me. Oh, I don't know who could be any greater. And who could do any more for you or not 
one millionth of what he could. There's nobody could do for you what Jesus does when he comes in. But he's turned away. Now you'll say to me, just a moment, Brother Branham. I did that a long time ago. That's good. I'm glad you did. For I say it's the greatest thing you ever done. Is when you let Jesus come into your heart. Amen, that's right. That's the greatest move that you could ever make. It's changed you from death to life. Let Jesus come in. But now after he's in, is he welcome to every door there is in your house? That's the next thing. Oh, sure, you'll accept his salvation. You do not want to go to hell. But will you let him be your Lord? He wants to come in and be ruler. That's the reason he wants to come in. You don't know what to do. He does know what to do. Many people will accept him as Savior. But then to accept him as Lord is different. What a difference between being Savior and being Lord. As a Savior, He would save you from your sin. But to be Lord, He's ruler. You let Him in, but you won't let Him rule. For in the human heart, is just like the door there to the house. After you come in, come in, sir, sit down. But these other little doors, I don't want you fooling around in my house. I want to speak on a few of those doors. All kinds of little private doors in your private life. Jesus can be your Savior, but don't you never try to tell me what to do, Lord. I know what I want to do. And don't you never try to rule me. That's the attitude of many people who profess Christianity. I'll listen to what the pastor says. That's good. But if it's contrary to what Jesus said, then it's wrong. I'll do what the church says if that's good. But if it's contrary to what the Bible says, then it's wrong. You must let him be the supreme ruler. That is, he's over all. He's over your opinions. He's over everything that you have. He's over your emotions. He's over your ideas. He's all controls every fiber of your thinking. Everything that you are, you should turn it over to Him if He's going to be your Savior and your Lord. How many of us do it? I want to speak of a few things. There is a little door when you get into the human heart, you turn to the left. And that's a little door of selfishness. Oh, we don't want to go to hell, sure not. But we've just got a little idea that, that we're just a little bit better than somebody else. Now, if he can't get into that, well, then you're always going to have that idea. I'll go to church for what I can get out of it. I'll rank among better people. And if I'm ever in trouble, then, of course, if I can say I'm a member of a certain, certain church, I'm sure that people will look up to me and say, that man is a real member of a certain church. God can't use you like that. He's got to control that, too. Then there's another little door. And that little door is called pride. Oh, that's a hard one to get open. You know, it's just human beings are just prone to think that maybe they're just a little better than the Joneses, you know. Especially here in America. You just paint your steps red. Watch your neighbor paint his red. <laughs> And you, sister, wear just a certain little thing on your hat when you go to church. 
Your neighbor just can't stand it. Oh, it's such a day of trying to impersonate a matching. You buy you a Chevrolet, and the Joneses has got a Ford, and your Chevrolet is just a little bit better maybe than their Ford. Watch them get a Chevrolet right away. Oh, it's a matching time. I've had this remark, and I don't mean it personally. I don't mean any harm by it. But sometimes when I get ready to go to church, my wife will come over and say, Billy, do you think that that tie matches that suit? I said, I don't know, honey. And I'll have on a pair of red socks and black trousers and a blue tie. Oh, I don't know. She said, that don't match. I said, honey, I'm not concerned whether my trousers match my coat or whether my tie matches my suit. I'm concerned about one matching. I want my experience to match God's Bible. That's where we ought to match God's requirement. But it's a matching time. Pride. Dress a little better. Go to a little better church, what we call better. And dress a little better. And always, but we don't want Christ to come into that. Now, Lord, you can save me, but don't go to fooling with my business. Now, I'll take care of myself. Now, I know that sounds very rude, but that's the truth. It certainly is. People don't want Christ fooling with their business. And if I want to be just a little bit dishonest on this deal, now, Christ, you just stand right out here just a little bit, but I, I, just, I just have to do this because I have need to do it. Oh, it won't hurt me any, I'm sure. If you just let him come into that door, he'll fix that all up for you. He'll stand at the door when the enemy tries to tempt you to do wrong. There's another door that I'd like to speak of for a moment. And that's the door of faith. So many people will let him in the door of Savior, but you won't let him rule you in your faith. Now you say, oh yes, Brother Branham. Oh, I believe Jesus Christ. But the days of miracles is past. There is no such thing as divine healing. There is no supernatural. What is it? You won't let Christ get into that door. You let somebody else talk you out of it. Why don't you just open that door and say, Lord, take over my faith tonight. Watch what will take place. Sure, he'll take over. He'll rule a thing. If the doctor cannot do you any good in his medical professions, which we thank God for, if he's got to a place to his limited ability, has come to its end, why don't you let Christ unlock that door of faith and step in there and take His word then? Watch what will take place. Oh my! When He examines you again, He says, What happened to you? Here some time ago, a woman had cancer. And the cancer was just about to kill her. And we asked our blessed Lord to help her. And He did. The doctor had given her up. A few months later, her son, I believe, was, he'd done something about, I forget now what it was, some about taking away some chemical stuff that took away insects out of the house and so forth. I don't know what that name is you call that now. Exterminator or something like that? That he was in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. She was in Jonesboro. When she come in the prayer line, she had a handkerchief over her nose. I thought she was weeping. But come to find out she had no nose. That the nose had been eaten off by a cancer. I said, have you been to the doctor, my sister? She said, Mr. Branham, he's giving me radium treatments and everything, and it continually goes on. I said, then let Christ have your faith. 
and then you have new faith. You have Oh, he said, I don't believe I do. And she told him who she was. And he said, oh, you are the woman that I've got you on the list over here that your nose were eating off by cancer. Had been eaten off. She said, that's right. She said, he said, well, I never had seen you in so long. I wondered where you went. Oh, she said, I changed doctors. Said, who did you go to? Said, I would like to compliment him on the great job that he did. She said, sir, I went to Dr. Jesus. Oh, he said, I'm sorry. I, where does he practice that? I don't believe I know him. She said, in glory. Oh, could you imagine that? And supposedly to be a Christian nation. What happened to the woman? She let Christ come in, the new doctor, and he opened a little gate or a little door that she really didn't know it existed in her heart. But let Christ come into it once. Watch what takes place. Wish I had time. There's more doors. But I want to hurry. There's another door that I wish to speak of. That's your eyes. Do you know you can be blind and don't know it? The Lord has in the Bible said that He would anoint our eyes with eye salve. Did you ever hear of that? You know, I'm a southerner, and I was raised on possum and coon and so forth. And my granddaddy used to trap a lot, and he used to catch coons. And how I love to hunt him yet. And so he would render out the grease. And when any of us children got cold in her eyes and the little eyes be matted together, Mama would go get some of the coon grease and rub it on her eyes. And just in a little bit, it penetrated in and the light began to break through. And we could see where we could not see before. That's the way it is with God. He's got some holy oil of the Holy Spirit and He can rub on your eyes as I save and you'll see things that you never saw before. New light will break through. You say to me, I've got good eyesight, Mr. Branham. Well, I'm thankful for that. But you might have ever such a good physical sight and be spiritually blind. Let God open your spiritual sight. After all, you don't see with your eyes. Did you know that? No. You look with your eyes, you see with your heart. Jesus said, St. John 3, Except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You mean you can't understand the kingdom of God until you're born again. You look right at a certain thing and say, I just don't see it. You're looking with your eyes, but you mean you don't understand it. And that's the kind of an eyes tonight that must be opened and there's only one slab that will do it. Oh, you couldn't take a shot of penicillin for it. Neither could you ever bathe your eyes with coon grease and do it. No doctor has a remedy for it. But God has the Holy Spirit of His anointing oil that He pours on your oil, on your eyes, and you say, Now I see. I once was lost and now I'm found was blind, but now I see. That's the eyes we want to open. You can watch at the platform. Look at the Bible. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And your eyes open, and you can see Him. After His resurrection, there was some man 
One of them's name was Theopius. And his friend was on their journey back down the road, going back to their old task again. And as they went down along the road, a stranger come out. A man that they had walked with for three and a half years. Walked, dodged every cobblestone down along that rough road if he ever walked it. Went around every bend. Shook hands with him. And was blind and didn't know him. Until he got them down to Emmaus, got on the inside of the room with them, and then he opened their eyes. And they recognized that it was the Lord. Oh, as soon as their eyes were open, it take them the whole Sabbath day to journey. They were back over there just in a few minutes. When your eyes come open, you go to work for God right quick. You don't worry no more. You just go to work. On the inside of the heart is the eyes, the eyes of understanding. A minister said to me some time ago, I was in a house meeting, and he said to me, Mr. Branham, I'll bring up a little crippled girl, and if you'll heal that girl, I'll believe you. I said, I'm going to say the same thing to you that my Lord said to your pappy, get behind me, Satan. You know that's exactly right. I said, I've got a sinner friend sitting out here in the house that's got a cigar in his mouth that long, cursing every breath because his wife's in this meeting. You go save that man, and I'll believe that you can save. He said, I can if he believe." I said, have the girl to make the same faith, and I can too. Certainly. It's based upon your faith. In the days of our Lord Jesus, the people couldn't doubt him being a healer, but they said he wasn't a savior. The devil just burst the table on him. Today they say he can save, but he can't heal. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The savior, the healer. The King of Heaven, the author of eternal life, and the giver of every good gift comes from God through Jesus Christ. Your eyes being open. Oh, if we could only see, watch and see what He does in His great powers, especially in these days now, that when we're living in this tremendous time, the shake of the people, where people don't know what to do, America needs missionaries worse than any nation I was ever in. That's right. Now, I say this not to be different. And with this Bible laying open before me, it's the Word of the living God. But do you know what the word heathen means? A heathen means an unbeliever. And it's better to, and easier to convert a heathen that has no education than to try to convert one that does have an education. That's right. The heathen with no education will be simple in his thinking. But the heathen that has an education, he'll figure every way around he can to make it alive. The devil has used the educational system to send more souls to hell than anything I know of. That's exactly the truth. I don't mean for your children to grow up illiterate, but first place Christ at the door. But don't never place education ahead of Christ. Education will cease. Christ will never. Let Christ come into the heart. Then the rest education will follow. I'd rather my little boy Joseph over there not even know his ABCs and know Jesus as his Savior than to have him to have all the education in the world and be the president of the United States and not know Christ. Absolutely. I'd rather have it. If he could be both, it would be fine. But if I had preference, let him know Christ. And if he has to be a beggar on the street, 
let him know Christ. It be my prayer to God. The eyes open. We look at flashy things. Remember, everything that glitters is not gold. I've done a lot of prospecting. And fool's gold, which is iron pyrite, shines a lot brighter than real gold. But the value in it, be sure that your eyes see the right thing. But the American people, we have just seen so much of God. God's been so good to us until we don't recognize it. It becomes, you say, let's go down to the meeting to some neighbor. Who's preaching? Well, so-and-so, Oral Roberts. Oh, Oral Roberts is a great man of faith. Oh, he has a, if you excuse the expression, a bulldog grip. He'll stand there and throw that big hand down and holler three or four times and nothing else. He'll scare the devil out of you. But he has a bulldog grip. He believes it. And God honors it. Oh, Roberts is my bosom friend. A mighty man of faith. Oh, I've heard old Roberts before. You say, well, Brother Branham's down there. Oh, yes, I've seen Brother Branham stand up there and it would be discernment and tell the people I've seen that before. The trouble of it is you've seen so much of it, it's become so common to you till it doesn't give the results that it ought to give. In closing, I might make this statement. A man once was going to the sea. He wanted to smell the salt water. He wanted to hear the wild gulls flying over. He wanted to see the great spray out of the waves as they leaped into the air with the salt briny spray. He wanted to take his shoes off, wade up and down the banks in the salt water. Oh, it was going to be a real thrill for him to get out there. On his road there, he met a man returning, which was an old salt, as we call it, a sailor. And he said, Where goest thou, my good man? He said, Oh, sailor from the big sea. He said, I'm going down to enjoy the blessings of the salt water and of the blue skies and the many things that the sea holds. Oh, he said, I was raised on it. I don't see nothing thrilling about it. You see, he had saw it so much and enjoyed it so much till it become common. That's what you Americans have done to Christ. He's been so good to you. You see him open the eyes of the blind. Some wouldn't walk across the street to see it again. You've seen him heal the sick. You've seen him perform miracles. You've done all this, and it's so common. It doesn't feel. It's been my great mystery in my life. How can the Scriptures be so plain and the people sit there and know that the Spirit of Christ is in the room and can hold your peace? I can't understand it unless their eyes are not open. He's so good. Way down in the south, we had an old darky down there, a colored brother, a minister, wonderful brother. And around his wife and all of them tried to persuade another man. His name was Gabriel. We just all called him Gabe. Gabe was just short for Gabriel. And he was a good old man, but we never could get him lined out for Christ. When I'd have the meetings down there, he'd say, no, sir, I sure not go there where Parson Branham is. He'd call out all my sins before me. I ain't going over there. And I like to hunt so well, so, and Gabe liked to hunt too. And his pastor down there, of the colored congregation of Pentecostal church. He, he liked to hunt too. So he took Gabe out hunting one day, and Gabe was a poor shot. He couldn't hit the side of a barn. He just couldn't hit nothing. But he liked to hunt. So that day while they were hunting, they had shot so much game until on the road home they had rabbits and 
birds all over them. They could just barely walk along with so much gain. And the faithful old colored pastor was walking in front with his gun in his arm, and Gabe loaded down with game, wagging along behind him. And after a while, they come around a familiar old path when the sun was setting, and the old Gabe touched the pastor on the shoulder. He said, Parson, and he looked around and said, Yes, Gabe. And he noticed Gabe chuckling, and the tears was running down his cheeks. He said, Gabe, what's the matter? He said, Parson, Sunday morning, you're going to find me at the Mona's bench. And he said, after I leave there, I'm going to take me a seat in the church. And Parson, there I'll live and serve God as long as I live. And the pastor said, Gabe, you know, I'm happy to know about that. He said, I'm so happy, but look, Gabe, I want to ask you something. He said, why the sudden change? I've preached, I've begged, I've persuaded your wife has fasted and prayed. He said, what made the sudden change? He said, Parson, you know I'm a bad shot. He said, I couldn't hit nothing. He said, just look at all this game he's given me. Why, he said, you know he loves me or he wouldn't have given me all this game. If you just notice and let your eyes come open, he's all around you. He's willing. He's ready. He's wanting to give you good things, laid you with his blessings that you can praise him and testify of his goodness. But if God will just speak to your heart and open that door that your eyes can see that is here and his goodness, he'll load you with it. My prayer is that you open your heart tonight, your understanding, open your heart of faith, open the door to the selfishness, open to the door of indifference, open the door of malice that's in your heart and let Christ come in and be full Lord and governor over your life. Let us pray. With our heads bowed. Eternal and blessed God, such a wonderful audience we could just speak seemingly all night. But the hour is moving on. We thank thee that thou dost still knock at the man's heart's door. We thank thee that thou art still willing to come in and sup and discuss with us any problem that we have. If it is sin, you'll discuss it with us. If it's we got pride, you'll discuss that and give us the cure. If it's sickness, thou art a great physician standing at the door knocking. If it's lack of understanding, you'll open our eyes. If a man likes wisdom, let him ask God. That's the Scripture, Father. And we believe it to be thy truth. I pray, God, that just now that you'll knock at many hearts. Those, every heart that has a need, may your Holy Spirit at the door now knock and say, Child of man, open up your door and I'll come in and discuss this problem with you. If you want more grace, I'll give it to you. If you want more faith, I'll give it to you. If you want your eyes of understanding to be open, I have the salve for them. I'm the great physician. I'm the one who kept the Israelites food all through the 40 years of journey. I preserved their clothing till they never went threadbare. And there was only one prescription in the great satchel of Dr. Moses. Oh, God, 
how if the people could read that prescription tonight, if the doctors of America and all over the world could only see the prescription that Dr. Moses, over two million people, brought them through the wilderness. Hundreds of babies born every night. Old people, and yet they come out of the wilderness, not a feeble one in their midst. What if our doctors could get that prescription? Father God, it's here in your suitcase tonight. Your suitcase of promises and blessings. And this is the way it reads, Father, as I read it. I'm the Lord that heals all thy diseases. That takes care of it. It's your word. It's your promise. Open understanding, Lord, of the people tonight. That they will understand. Open their heart and let you be their Lord, their ruler. Not only their Savior, but their Lord and ruler. Their God. That they might be controlled by thy Holy Spirit. For we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus, thy Son. With our heads bound. Just go to ask this question, and please, everyone, keep your head bowed. Sometimes a sinner friend is just a little conscious. God hates sin, but He loves a sinner. He gave His life. Sinner friend, in the overflow rooms or in the main auditorium, you want Him to come in tonight? Has he knocked? He, you know, he won't. If you knock at someone's door and they wouldn't let you in, you wouldn't go back no more. But not him. Maybe he's knocked for years. But sometime he will make his final call. Would you like to let him in tonight? No one looking. Raise your hand, sinner friend. I'll never ask you to do no more. Just raise your hand to God. God bless you. Someone else, God bless you. So, God bless you. You, 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 you. Sinner friend, God bless you. Over in the overflow room, just raise your hands. Anywhere over along those windows. And wherever else in the building where the television cast is coming in now, just raise your hand. God sees it. Yes, Lord, I, I need you. I now will receive you as my Savior. Say, Brother Bram, does that mean anything when you raise your hands? Well, it's making a decision. It's between death and life. It's not so complicated. It's just you believing it. We try to make it. You have to study catechism six years, and you have to go six months on probation. That's man-made doctrine. He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall never come to the judgment, but pass from death unto life, when he believes. If you believe, just raise your hand. Say, yes, Lord, be merciful to me. I now believe. God bless you over there, lady. God bless you, lady. God bless you. That's good. I now believe. Lord, help thou my unbelief. God bless you back there, sir. God bless you. Someone else? God bless you over here, sir, to my right. Back in the corner. I haven't looked at my right side yet. Raise your hands if there's anyone back there would... Love to say, Lord Jesus, open up. I do my heart. Now, I pull the latch down. I've been closed in with a lot of selfishness for a long time. Maybe tomorrow or some other day, but tonight I'm pulling back the latch. I want you to come in. He'll do it as soon as you raise your hand. And you can't raise your hand unless he calls you. What if you was one of those kind that can never feel God anymore? You know, there's some people, God not willing that any should perish, but there's some people that never can be saved. Not because God don't want it, but God by foreknowledge knew it. How many in here tonight that's already Christians and have, God bless you, young man, that's already Christians, and, but you're not leading the right kind of a life as a Christian. You say, Jesus, come in and take the door, selfishness, pride, whatever it is in the way, and open up my door tonight. Would you raise your hands? God bless you. That's, that's right. God bless you. All my many 30, 40 hands. God bless you, ladies. Certainly the Lord sees you. 
How many has been, God bless you over there, young fellow. God bless you, young man. I've been different, Brother Bram. I've never lived a complete Christian life. I want God to take my doors right now and swing them open. Take all the pride and selfishness and world out of me. I know I've accepted Him as my Savior, but I want to be a full surrendered Christian. Pray for me, Brother Branham. I now raise my hand and say, God, I'll surrender my life to you. God bless you, young lady. God bless you, sister. God bless the young girl here, the young man over here, the little girl and boy back there, the young man in the back, this brother down here. Yes, God bless you in the back also. That's right. Down here, sir. The Lord be with you. Now I'm going to ask one more question while you have your heads bowed. How many in here would say, Brother Branham, I've read in the Bible, I've been listening at you the last few nights. I hear how Jesus Christ made himself known to the Jews by discerning the thought of a man named Nathaniel. And Nathaniel said, when he told him who he was, told Peter what his name was, and the disciples and those, as soon as he made himself known, the Jews understood him and said, that's the sign of Christ. Thou art the Christ, thou art the Son of God, Rabbi. And when he's done this same miracle and told the Samaritan woman, when he made himself known to the Samaritans, and the woman had five husbands, and he asked her for a drink, she told him the well was deep and he had nothing to draw with. He said, go get your husband and come here. She said, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. We know when the Messiah cometh, that's the sign of the Messiah. He'll do these things, but who are you? He said, I'm he that speaks to you. He made himself known to the Samaritans that way. Now, why didn't he make himself known to the Gentile? He told him not to go to the Gentile. That's this day. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You say, Lord, I have watched it. But tonight, maybe it's been too common for me. Maybe tonight, Lord, if you just open my eyes of understanding and anoint my eyes with spiritual sight, let me, Lord, see your presence tonight and know and understand that I'm living just before the world meets us in. The Sputniks and bombs, and they say within a year they're going to send a rocket to the moon. That's nonsense. It's a modern Babylon. Can't you see we're at the end time? Say, Lord, open my eyes to understand. Would you raise your hands with your heads bowed? Open up my eyes, Lord, let me understand. God bless you. That's good. That's good. God bless you. Fine. God bless you back there, sir. God bless our colored brother there. Rest. That's right. Oh, God bless you back there, my brother. Sure. Open my eyes, Lord. Here's, the, here's my heart. Here's every key. Here's everything. Just open up, Lord. Let, uh, you be Lord. You govern my faith. You govern my emotions. You govern my... My eyes, you govern everything, Lord. Just take me, Lord. Here I am. Let me be fully surrendered. God bless you. Over in the rooms, the overflows, and so forth. The Lord bless you. Now let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, preaching all night, we love to do it. Speak to your children where they're eating, and it's such a blessing to let the Holy Spirit come in and feed on the Word. Now, that's not all, Lord. We're so thankful that you have cut off even that to unbelief. But, Lord, God, you make your word manifest. You prove that the word is true by demonstrating it. Go ye into all the world and demonstrate the power of the Holy Ghost to every nation. Lo, I am with you always. The works that I do shall you also. More than this shall you do, for I go to the Father. A little while, and the world won't see me no more. Yet ye shall see me, for I'll be with you, in you to the end of the world. No wonder Paul could say, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Bless these people. I know that these who raise their hands are saved. I know those who had differences. It'll be cleared up, and those who could not understand, their eyes will be open tonight. Their faith will be turned loose, and this will be one of the greatest climaxes we've ever seen in this revival. Grant it, Father. Now to my own self, I surrender my heart, my all to you. 
My emotions might be, speak, Lord, and let the people know that thou art Christ, and I'll be your servant. For I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Do you feel good? Hallelujah. That's lovely, sister. Let's just sing one verse of that. You love to sing? Now, look, you can have all your little uh, sh- songs you want, the little jubilees. Give me the old-fashioned kind. I'm just old-fashioned. I-, I love it. Oh, my. Don't you love that pass me not, O oh, gentle Savior? Hear my humble cry. Anybody know who wrote it? Sure, Fanny Crosby. She was blind. You remember the story when the English writers come and wanted to write some of these modern songs of love songs, which would be nice today, but she refused to write anything else but religious songs. And one of them said, as two of them were talking to her, if there is a heaven and you go to it, you'll never see Christ. What if you were blind when you get there? Then what, how would you know him if you were still blind? And she said, I know him. I shall know him, though I be blind. Yet I know him. And she turned and started waving her way through the house. And the inspiration struck her of this song. I shall know, yes, I shall know him. And redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him by the prints of the nails in his hand. Said, I'll feel his hands and I'll know him. Certainly, any man or woman's ever done anything for God has swung their heart of faith open and stood gallantly for Christ. God grant it to you. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, a year my humble cry. Oh, I Never did pass anyone. He hears their cry. I wish I could bring all the sick up on the platform and go through the discernment if the Lord will permit it. I don't know that he will. How many is in the building tonight's never been in one of my meetings before? I see your hand. Just look. See what I mean? That's the reason I have different ones to speak before. I guess you all have explained the ministry before I got in heaven. Of how that someone comes to introduce before I come to the platform the ministry. I do not claim to be a healer, friends. I can't heal. No other man can heal. Brother Oral Roberts, a great man of God, but he doesn't heal you. He just lays hands on you and asks God. Brother Valdez, Brother Allen, and just many great men, your own pastor here, a great man in the field who pray for the sick, but none of them heal. Now, they're preachers. They can take a hold of the Word and preach it. I'm not a preacher. I'm, I have no education, so I can't preach. You know that now. But what the Lord has given me is a different type of a ministry. It's a ministry of seeing vision. How many knows that God promised to set that in the church? How many knows that gifts and callings are without repentance? How many knows the difference that a gift of prophecy is not a prophet? Certainly, a gift of prophecy is to be judged by two or three before it may be given, but a prophet is born. 
Thus saith the Lord in childhood. See? The Bible said, first are apostles. Is that right? Well, apostles, we call them today missionary. That's the first. The highest calling is a missionary. What does apostle mean? One cent. What does a missionary mean? One cent. A missionary, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists. How many knows that's true? Well, we have to have them all. Some pastors, some teachers, some evangelists, some missionaries, and some prophets. Now, we have those things in the church. They're what are they for? Does the, is the apostle is the highest calling. A missionary is the highest calling. Prophets and so forth down. But they're not any different. They're all God's servants set together to temper and bring the body of Christ together. When Jesus was on earth, he didn't claim to be a healer. He claimed to be the Son of God and said the Father was in him. How many knows that? How many knows that he said in St. John 5, 19, he did nothing until he, the Father showed him what to do. He saw what the Father was doing and went and done it. He said that. He couldn't lie. He was God. See? So he never done one miracle until first he saw a vision what the Father told him to do. People would come to him. He would know their name. He would tell them what was wrong, what they'd been doing. How many knows that's right? How many knows that that's the way he made himself known? And Israel recognized him by that, so that's the sign of the Messiah. How many knows that the Bible says that? St. John, the first chapter. How many knows that that's the way he manifests himself to the Samaritan nation? That's how this woman knows. When he told the people in Samaria, said, come see a man that told me the things I've done. Isn't this the Messiah? If he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, he does the same yesterday, today, and forever. How could you take the life out of an apple tree and put it in a peach tree? What kind of a life, what would the peach tree bear? Apples. Take the life of a sinner out and put the life of Christ in there, it'll bear the fruits of Christ. Is that right? He said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. The vine doesn't bear fruit. It, pur it purges the branches, and the branches bear fruit, if it's a good, healthy branch. If a lot of vines uh, is wrapped around it and isms and things wrapped around it, it's cut off all the circulation, it won't be nothing. But if it's a good, healthy branch, it'll bring forth the fruits of the vine. Is that right? Well, the church is the branches. He's the vine. So it absolutely would have to bring forth his life. If he does that, and does the same things tonight in the church that he did before his crucifixion and resurrection, how many will say, I truly believe, you newcomers, I truly believe that he's raised from the dead if he'll manifest himself tonight through his church just the same as he did when he was your owner. Raise your hands, will you, to the audience? That's fine. That's really good. May the Lord grant it. I want to pray for these. Remind me, somebody, after the Holy Spirit has anointed. Now I. Did you do that? What did you get out today? W. They give out prayer card W, and I've explained how. Here I'll show to the newcomers. How many in here wants to be prayed for tonight? Be honest. Something wrong? You want to be prayed for? Raise up your hands. Everywhere in the building, wherever you are, anywhere. Four-fifths of the audience. Oh, well, who's going to be first? We can't get to too many. Vision's just one weakened the Son of God. How many know that a woman touched his garment? She was weakened. See? My ministry is not laying my hands on you. That's a Jewish tradition. The Jew said, My daughter's laying sick unto death. Come lay your hands on her and she'll get well. But the Gentile said, I'm not worthy that you come under my roof. Just speak the word and my servant will live. Jesus said, I've never found faith like that in Israel. There's a way to believe it. Just ask him. Here's his word. Now the next thing to prove, is he alive? Do you believe he's alive? Sure, he's alive. And now the only thing that's different, he's here in spirit form in the spirit of physical form. How many knows that? And the spirit form works through, he don't have any hands but mine, your hands. No eyes, but mine your eyes. No mouth, but mine your mouth. And they should be surrendered. God has made us one to be this way and one to be that way. Mine, my part is just surrender myself to a gift and just watch 
And more I'm not a preacher to speak, I have, Lord uses my eyes to see things. That's been in the past. We'll be in the future. And I'll take any person in here to this, or anywhere you wish to go, out of the tens of thousands times tens of thousands, not one time has it ever failed. These things you see happen here are minor. That's the things that you do. I can't operate it. You operate that. If you had no faith, nothing would happen. But with your faith, you don't have to be up here on the platform. This woman touched his garment, went out in the audience and sat down or wherever she was. Jesus said, somebody touch me. Turned around and looked till he found where she was. There she was, a woman with a blood issue, and told her her faith had saved her. She didn't say, I did it. Your faith has saved you. Now, did you notice that word, saved? The Greek word, sozo, there, I believe. Sozo, physically or, or spiritual. Either one. You're saved from your sickness or saved from your sin. Both same word all the way through the Bible every time. Sozo, the Greek word. Now, your faith has saved you. Does the Bible say he's a high priest? The New Testament says he's a high priest and can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. How many knows the New Testament says that? Do you believe then if he's alive? and alive and your faith can touch him, he'd speak back to and do the same thing he did there to declare himself to still be the high priest alive? Then pray. God will grant him. Somewhere we have to call. I can't get my mind working right on what to call. What did we call the first night? From one? Last night from 85 to 100? Well, let's call tonight on prayer cards W. Take your prayer card. Look at it. It's got a letter W. What is it? It's a little card. Bible. Now, if, if you'll just give me your undivided attention just for a few moments. Now, this is the time that we're our Lord. The promise that he made is either the truth or it isn't the truth. Now, which would be easier for you to accept your healing by his promise or come here and see him do something, you'll take my place up here. But what it is, he just makes his word the truth. He, he, he makes every word the truth. All is truth. Now, I'll be in you. The works that I do shall you also. Now, at the gate of Samaria, at the well... A woman and a man met together, Jesus and the woman of Samaria. He talked to her a few minutes till he found out where her trouble was. The father showed him, certainly. The father told him to go up to Samaria. He was on his road to Jericho, you know that. And he went up to Samaria, way out of his way, set on the well. The father said, go up there, but he didn't know what to do. The woman come out. He caught the woman and began to teach her, talk to her. And when he, the father showed him where her trouble was, he told her where her trouble was. And when he did it, she said, this is the sign of the Messiah. How many knows that to be true? The same yesterday, today, and forever. I should get that clear. I didn't say I was Messiah. Get that straight. I'm your brother, a sinner, saved by grace the way you are. Unworthy of any blessing. But he has to use somebody. He has to choose someone. No hands are holy enough for that. Certainly not. But he has to use someone's. It's not our holiness anyhow we trust in. It's his merits. Not nothing I could do. It's what he has done, and I believe. Now, I want to tell you, the visions weaken me so much. I want to tell you goodbye, and the Lord bless you real good, and pray for me as I go along. The Spirit of the Lord is coming near and near all the time. How many has got the picture of it now in here? How many has seen the picture? Chase it down, find it, if that's right or not. That same light that you see on the picture is not two foot from where I'm standing right now. You say, Brother Van, if you could see it, could I see it? Not necessarily. None of them saw the star but the three wise men. The group that was with Paul, they heard a rumbling noise, but they didn't see the light, and the light was surreal to Paul to put his eyes out for a season. God reveals as he will. Now, I suppose, sister, the lady standing here, that you and I are strangers to each other, are we? Would you just, answer, I, after being preaching, it's another anointing. 
And I have to wait for that. That's the reason you're up here, just so that I can find somebody that will, that will, I could get segregated from the rest of the people to talk to a few minutes. Now, if we are strangers to each other and have never seen each other in life, so far as I know, unless you've been sitting in a meeting and looked at me, but I don't know you, you know that. If the Lord Jesus will come now and say to you, or reveal something if, in your life, Maybe what's wrong, where your trouble is. You know, I don't know that. Lady. How many knows the audience? This woman, I raise my hands. I don't believe in swearing, but here's my hands before the Bible. I never seen the woman, and she's never seen me outside of just being in the meeting and looking at me. I guess in this meeting here, sitting here looking at me. I don't know her. Now, if I said, "Lady, what's wrong with you?" and she'd say, "I have cancer, or I have TB, or I have something wrong with me." Put my hands on her and say, The Lord says you're going to be well. Hallelujah. Go on. Well, that might be all right. She might have faith to believe that. You're going to be well. A year from the day, you're going to be well. She can scratch her head and say, I wonder. That's still not a miracle. But if God will go back down in her life somewhere to something that she knows is the truth, and I don't know, and then we'll reveal it. Let her be the judge. Then she'll know it has to be a supernatural power and not a man. Is that right? Would that be right, lady? Now, he'd have to act the same as he did when he was here on earth in a physical body. He'd have to take my physical body and her physical body. My faith in his word, her faith in his gift. As she'll approach reverently, she will receive. Now, she knows it comes from a supernatural power. Now, if she believes like the Pharisees, it's Beelzebub, then she'll get his reward. If she believes it's Christ, then she'll get Christ's reward. Now, the rest is up to God. This is as far as I can go as a human being. God be with you and help you. Just to contact your spirit, sister. Just to see what he would tell me. He might not tell me one thing. I want to ask you a question. Do you believe what I preached is the truth about him? If he didn't reveal one thing to me, would you still believe if I prayed for you, you'd get well? Or, or you'd get what, you, I don't know, what you're here for. But would you believe it anyhow? If I didn't do no more than just pray for you and pass you through the line, you'd believe it anyhow. God bless you. I, I believe you would. But just that the people might know his resurrection, may he grant to let, you know, how many, if the Lord will reveal, let her be the judge with her hands up. You'll be honest about it, will you, lady? Raise your hand so the people see this. Put your hands like you're not swearing, just so that they see that you understand what I mean. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Let her be the judge whether it be right. If he does it, I don't say that he will. How many of them will say, that settles it for me? I believe it. I'll, I'll, if the Jew could believe it on one time, the Samaritan could believe it on one time, what ought the Gentile to do? I think and how pitiful it's going to be for the people that the Lord God has blessed to see. And yet, we'll never know it till it's done, passed over and gone. That's the way it's been in every age. It won't be no different in this age. If the people can still hear my voice, the lady is moving from you. And I see her, she's in a terrible condition. She suffers with a nervous condition. And also she has a heart trouble. Not only that, but she has trouble in her throat. That's right. And you have stomach trouble. That's right. I'll let her be the judge. Was those things that he said, the only way I'll know what it was is pick it up on my tape down there. That wasn't me. Couldn't have been me. Ask the lady if whatever he told her was right. Was that right? Just wave your handkerchief. So. It's right. God knows it. it's right. There you are. You believe now? now let's, we're in no hurry. 
Don't be pressing. Now, you without prayer cards, it's not going to be called in the line. You look this way and just keep believing. Saying, Lord, I believe that with all my heart. Just keep looking and believing. That's it. Just don't be in a hurry. Just be quiet. I want to talk to you again. Whatever he told you was right. I know this is, takes strength. But you're a nice person. You have a wonderful feeling to your spirit. You are a Christian. I mean a born again Christian. You're not from here, though. You're from Michigan. You like Benton Harbor real well, do you? (laughs) Hallelujah. Your name's Lydia. Your last name's Schroeder. Yes. Oh, God. You believe it's over for you now? Oh, God. Go on your Thank way. You reach out. Hallelujah. Oh, God, be merciful to our sister. How do you do, lady? Do you truly believe? Believe with all your heart? If the Lord God shall find favor tonight... To say to you something, I see you're something you can't stand well. Would you help her there just a moment, brother? Yes. I look here to me and believe with all your heart. The lady is suffering with a heart trouble. You also have a cough. It's an asthmatic cough. That's right. And you have bronchial trouble, says the doctor. That is true. That is true. Absolutely. The reason, it's not your feet. You're just weak. You've been in a bed for several days and got out of bed to come here to be prayed for. That's thus saith the Lord. That's right, isn't it? I did. God shall reward you for this. Let us pray. <laughs> Almighty God, the strength of our being, give to this woman her healing. She must have it or die. And I pray, God, that you'll move every shadow and give her supernatural strength now that she can be healed. Through Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, sister. Don't doubt a bit that you're still take of this. Do you believe with all your hearts? Just have faith. That's all I ask you to do. Just look this way and believe. I can't heal. God's a healer. You're his subjects. How do you do? I suppose we're strangers to each other, are we, lady? I don't know you. You belong to some different religion. And many of them wear those little caps, different ones. But do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that He died that He might redeem us? Do you believe me to be His servant? I say that with respect. It's like Peter and John said, look on us. Not as Him but sent by him. If God will reveal to me, say for instance what you are or what's wrong with you, you will believe it. This is our first time ever meeting, I believe, in life. Is that right? You're a Mennonite to begin with. See your colony. And you're suffering with a liver trouble. That's right. That's not all on your heart. You've got something else on your heart. That's for your husband. He isn't here. If God will tell me what's wrong with your husband, what he's doing right now, will you believe me? He's coughing. He's got the flu. That's thus saith the Lord. Miss Miller, do you believe me to be the servant of God? (laughs) You do? 
Go back home, put that hand in the lobby. How do you do, sir? Guess we're strangers to each other. Philip went and found Nathaniel. And when he found him, he said, Come see who I found. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Philip said, or Nathaniel said, Could any good thing come out of Nazareth? He said, Come see. And on the road over, he told him that perhaps about the conversion of Peter and the others, how he called their names and told them who there was. He does the same thing today. He's the same Christ. When he got up there, he's about notion to believe. But when Jesus saw him, he said, Behold an Israelite in whom is no guile. We know, both know that we're mortal beings and got to face Christ someday. God be merciful to us. If the Holy Spirit will reveal to me what your trouble is, will you believe it? There's something that's in your back. It's your spine. Spinal trouble. And you have arthritis. You're not from here. You're from Chicago. You got something else on your mind. You're praying about it. You've been praying about it quite a while. It's a woman. It's your sister. She's not in Chicago. She's in Cleveland. She's got heart trouble and a mental case. You believe? Go find it the way you believe it, brother. Hallelujah. In the name of the Lord. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. How do you do? Jesus. We are strangers to each other. I don't know you. God does know you. You're not here for yourself. You're here for somebody else. Seriously sick, mighty city, Chicago. It's got tumor on the brain. Up for an operation. Extend that handkerchief. Don't doubt. And if what you believe, that's the way it'll be. God, give the blessings of what she's asked. Have we had three yet? Reverently, reverently, please. Just a minute. You see, it gets to a place to where the Holy Spirit see Christ. A person touched him and it was, uh, he said he got weak. Well, what do you think about me? The only reason I can stand a little longer because he said, more than this shall you do. It's his grace. Do you believe that Christ is here? How many believes it's his spirit permitting this to be done? Then bless you, you're going to have what you ask for, if you'll just believe it. I'm a stranger to you, I suppose, lady. I don't know you. God does know you. If he will reveal what your trouble, will you believe him? If we're strangers to each other, would you just raise up your hands like this? Now, audience. We're both witnesses before God's Word. If the Holy Spirit will do this one more time, will you all believe, promising you believe? Here's what it is. It's for a good thing. That is, you're trying to get to walk with Christ. You want a close walk with Him. You've had your ups and downs, backslidings, ins and outs. That's what you want, is a close walk with God. That's a worthy thing. Your faith has been shook about something. It caused you to be upset. That's the truth. You think God would reveal to me what upsets your faith? What you need is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Here's what it is. It's because that 
you're wanting a baby and you've had miscarriages and you can't pack your baby. That's thus saith the Lord. Will you surrender all to him now? Surrender your heart and all. Dear God, upon a penitent woman who comes humbly, seeing that shadow hanging over, I ask thee, dear God, just on the basis of her faith, to give to her what she asked for just now. May every heart, every door be swung wide open, and may she receive him just now for everything she has need of. This I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You be the judge. That's right. Raise your hands if that was right, whatever it was. Now, do you believe? What about you in the audience? Are you ready to believe? How about you over on this side of the line? Do you believe with all your heart? You without prayer cards. I want you to look this way. I want you to believe with all your heart. You pray. The angel of the Lord said to me, if you get the people to believe you, then be sincere when you pray. Nothing shall stand before the prayer. I'd like to get some in each line if I could. If God will permit it, have faith, people. This is our last night. Yes, here's a lady sitting right in here, looking right across the shoulder at me. Got trouble in your chest. That's right, lady. You're sitting right there. Glasses on, your hair combed down. You had chest trouble, didn't you? Breathe yourself deep. You heard what I said. You had chest trouble. You don't have it now. Your faith has made you well. I don't know you, do I, lady? I've never seen you. If that's right, stand up on your feet. Never seen you. Have no contact at all. There she is. Go home now. You're well. Jesus Christ heals you and makes you well. What about in this row in here, in this section? Let's come a little further. Will you believe? Who said that amen then that I heard? You? With your red hat on? You believe me to be God's prophet or his servant? That name stumbles people. I'm a stranger to you. I don't know you. But if you'll believe me, God will heal that arthritis for you. What'd you raise your hand for sitting by her? You want to be healed of spinal trouble, don't you? And the reason you raise your hand, you both come together and you're both Canadians, aren't you? You're not Americans, you're Canadians. Go back to Canada and spread the good news. Christ makes you well. You just have faith. Believe with all your heart. You can receive it. What do you think, lady? Did that strike you just well to believe on the Lord Jesus? You believe me to be his servant? You have a need of Christ to do something for you? You believe that he'll reveal it to me? You'll accept it? Then your rectal trouble will leave you. <laughs> That's what your trouble was. That be right, stand up on your feet. If we're strangers and don't know one, one, one another, is that right? All right. Then receive it. Are you believing? Hallelujah. Somebody in here. Have faith. Don't doubt. Believe. Troubles in your head. A lady blonde sitting there, gray head. You believe in Christ? You believe he can tell me what caused that head trouble? It's some gas. It's right. If you believe it, it's right. Raise your hands if that's right. I don't know you, do I? Never seen you in my life as far as I know. That's the truth, isn't it? But why do I know you from any different? There's that light hanging over you right now. It broke into a vision. Here it goes. Moves over to the next lady. Second lady, next one, sitting back on the end. Yes. You were wondering then, wasn't you? It's over you. I want to be honest with you. You be honest with me. 
There's a feeling at you right now like you've never had before, a real sweet, humble feeling. That's right, wave your hand. Then your high blood pressure left with it. You have faith. Hallelujah. If thou canst believe, Glory be to God. all things are possible. If thou canst believe, that's all he asks. Thank God heal that ruptured baby. Make it well. Well, I believe it. Don't doubt. And have what you ask for. You go believe it too, brother? That nervousness leaves you also. God bless you. I think that's across the building. You believe? Amen. You think Christ would heal that arthritis for you and make you well? Go believe him. Praise Children. God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless his name. If you'd believe him, that diabetes would leave, instantly be gone, you'd be well. Do you believe it? Amen. Then go believe Praise him. God. God bless you. You Hallelujah. have to believe him. When you raised up, you felt your back was different. Yes, I did. You were healed sitting here. You're awful young, but you got a nervous heart. You believe that God will make it well? Go believing now. Amen. When I said back trouble to the woman a few minutes ago, it struck you too, didn't it? You were healed right there in the line. Now go on your road rejoicing. Don't doubt nothing. You believe with all your heart. And you do too? You believe the same thing? You believe the smothering stuff will leave you and you'll be well? Go on your road. Go right on the road rejoicing. Let's say thanks be to God. Are you believing? Do you believe with all your heart? Does he do all things well? Is he the same yesterday, today, and forever? Do you believe it? Solemnly with all your heart? Then I'm going to ask you to do something. Put your hands over on one another just a minute. I'll show you the glory of God. Don't doubt. Have faith. I know I'm not beside myself, but I'm getting awful weak. I'm going to stop just a minute. I trust that God has confirmed what I've told you to be the truth. Nothing in me. Believe Him. It doesn't matter where you touch me, touch Him. Has he, he, he'll prove it. Now you lay your hands on each other. That's a scripture. The Bible said these signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands, their hands, on the sick, they shall recover. Over the overflow, lay your hands on each other if you're sick and needy. I'm going to pray for you. If you believe in my prayer, you have faith now. As you bow your head, I want to put in your mouth the words that will defeat the devil right now. You just pray them as I repeat them with your heads bowed. Almighty God, creator of heavens and earth, author of everlasting life, giver of every good gift, have mercy upon me. I am in need of thy grace and of thy healing power. Heal me, O Lord, and heal the person I have my hands on. Be merciful to them, Lord. I sympathize with them. For they are suffering too. I now believe that you are the risen Christ showing among us the great signs and wonders that you promised you would do. Be merciful to me and I'll serve you with all my heart as long as I live. And by your grace, this night, I accept you. Because you promised, I believe. I now am healed. I believe it. 
I accept it. I shall not listen to Satan anymore. I will praise God for my healing. For by Jesus stripes, I now am healed. Just keep closed in. Keep closed in, Reverend. You've prayed. You've said the right words. Just in your heart, feel His goodness coming down. Feel them keys turn that door in there. And that faith that you once wanted is now coming in loose. Something telling you, there's something here by me. Something is making me well. My headache is gone. My stomach trouble is vanished. Oh, I feel different in my limbs, my arms. New life is coming in. Keep that on your mind now while I ask the devil in Jesus' name to depart from you. That's the devil that would make you doubt it at any time. Lord God, creator of heavens and earth, I come to thee in the name of the Lord Jesus, asking you to be merciful and pardon our unbelief.